When we started our businesses, we thought that because we were great plumbers, that would translate into being great business owners. But that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, successfully operating a home service business has very little to do with the trades. Hey guys, I'm Tony Wally. And I'm Matt Baldwin, and this is The Coach's Corner, a podcast dedicated to helping you create a thriving business and stop thinking like a tradesman and start thinking like a CEO. Welcome to the show. What's going on, my man? How you doing, my man, Big T? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, you're always uh, you're always making fun of me because I'm older, and uh, it really hit home when I was at the doctor this last time, man. I... <laughs> so I turned 45, and I had to make an appointment to go get a colonoscopy. <laughs> oh, what fun! Yeah. Did that make you feel old? Um, well, that, let me just tell you real quick. So um, the whole thing made me feel like shit. So I was, uh, I had, you have to go to four. So when you, when you get a colonoscopy in 10 years, like for, for you, you'll have to go and get a consultation before the, the thing goes down. And um, mm-hmm. so I go in there and they, do the regular thing, the blood pressure and the height, the weight. And, uh, so you, and she walked out, the nurse walked out and as I'm waiting on the doctor and, uh, he comes in and, uh, he's a pretty, he's pretty cool, but he's very soft. I mean, he's very straightforward. And he was asking me a bunch of questions and, and he said, uh, he said, uh, I asked him, like the lady asked if uh if if I wore a CPAP machine, which I do because I used to keep Allison awake at night when I snore. A lot of information coming out of Big T Wally today, but so We're I was like, personal. yeah, We're getting yeah, personal. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I said, uh, I said, hey, why why did she ask if I wore a CPAP? I mean, this is colonoscopy. I'm not making the um, <laughs> I'm not making the connection. He's like, oh, it's just for the anesthesiologist, so so they'll know, and I still don't know why. But he said, uh, they about to put your ass out and hook you up to a CPAP so you ain't snoring. (laughs) But he said, he said, you know, but I bet if you lost some weight, you wouldn't need a CPAP machine. (laughs) And dude, I'm just sitting there, man. I'm like, hey, thanks, dude. I appreciate it. And, uh, (laughs) but he kept on talking and then he started trying to sell me on these shots that he takes. He's like, yeah, man, I used to weigh 250. Now I weigh 155. And he like held his eye contact at me, just like looking. And I was like, dude, that's good, man. That's, that's good. Uh, and, and I don't know if, if like he, if he looked at me and he was like, oh yeah, this dude needs to lose some weight or the fact that (laughs) I, (laughs) the fact that I wear a CPAP machine just automatically made him think, oh, well he's overweight. He needs to, uh, well, it wasn't him. It was the nurse that came in first. I thought you were fat. She was like, oh, this, this dude's got a CPAP. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The one that weighed me. (laughs) Let's, let's, let's make, let's make some notes. We're going to sell him these shots. Yeah, he was, he was, it was Ozempic, you know, all the celebrities are taking yeah. Ozempic. He's like, he's like, yeah, but it's pretty expensive though. I mean, I don't know if your insurance covered. And I was like, dude, how, how much <laughs> so you're worse fat, did so you're make fat, me feel about myself? You're fat and poor. Yeah, you're fat and poor. What are you still doing here? I don't give a shit if you die or not. If uh, We we may as well not do the colonoscopy, you <laughs> fat piece of shit. <laughs> That's what, so, so, so oh. he, uh, so he was like, uh. Uh, he ended up like after I was like, all right, dude, cool, man, I'll check into it. And then he was like and telling me what what was about to go down like the day before. You can't eat anything. You have to drink like chicken broth and then you have to drink these two two bottles of, of stuff that are going to clean me out. And golly, dude, it sounds like an absolute train wreck. So but I need to do it. I mean, you know, because I'm I'm old, like you like you always point out. Yeah, I have 11 plus years till I have to worry about that. <laughs> And when I say plus, I mean 11 and one month. (laughs) Um, Well, it's coming down. uh, No, you bring up an interesting point because me and Ashley actually experienced something where he was like, oh, it might not be covered by your insurance. Does he know that you own a plumbing company? Yeah. I had to throw that in after it made me feel like a total uh, jerk about existing in general. (laughs) So that that just brings up the you know, the old stereotype that we talk about, you know, 
um you know the book correct plumber right um yeah how you know the old stereotype of blue collar is lesser than um right. because me and ashley had a similar experience i mean not with the whole colonoscopy thing but you know we were fitting out our new office and we needed you know office furniture and whatever and it was this really strange interaction where we walked into this store um and we're like oh we got this new office we need some desks we need we're thinking about maybe doing like a modular partition office with the glass you know mm -hmm. um so that we could have some sort of private space uh with like a conference table and this guy i mean every single thing that we told him about he's like you could go with this chair but this chair is very expensive you could go with this desk but this desk is very you know this is this is not what you're going to get at staples you know like have you guys yeah. checked staples we were like like they're trying to run you out of there like trying to steer you towards a more economical decision yeah like he just felt like we didn't have money and he didn't want to waste his time because we told him that we own a plumbing company it was well, uh I I feel it like referring to the the pretty woman movie that, uh, with Julia Roberts, but that's probably before you were born. So uh, for those that are not, <laughs> I've uh, I've seen it. I've seen it. It was on uh, in between uh, I Love Lucy and Happy Days. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may as well just keep on going. <laughs> anyway, she was in the store and they tried to run her out, but she came back later because she had a bunch of money and a. A sugar daddy so she was like that was a big mistake yeah. to run me out of here sunday monday happy days tuesday podcast i never watched happy, happy days. days by the way i'm, I'm you no know, no you, you're not a Fonz fan no man that's way before my time i know well, well i guess it would be before your parents time which is why i watched it because my parents watched it yeah my parents were born in 49 both of them and then my parents were born in 62 and 66 which is probably closer to your birthday than my birthday uh anyway let's uh <laughs> man what a what um, guy what a friend yeah, we're just yeah i know i'm i'm a great guy and uh i think we've done enough enough uh jabba john hey plumbing pro you wouldn't plumb a house without a blueprint so why are you trying to build your plumbing business without one? Grab your free copy of my Million Dollar Plumber Blueprint. In it, I lay out the exact specs on how to build a successful, self-sustaining, and very profitable plumbing business. Don't risk years of wasted time and money and failure. Grab your Million Dollar Plumber Blueprint now, and it's free. My gift to you for simply being a Coach's Corner follower. Go to themilliondollarplumber.com forward slash free and plumb like a champion this is part three of our fear series yep. and uh it's been a good conversation so far I, I i've gotten seriously i've gotten a lot out of it and i remember these things when when we talk about them because they're not they may be in the rearview mirror for now i mean it may be temporary it may not be because things seem to come back around um but one of the other fears that we that we run into is the fear of hiring people and we may have touched on it you know before in in the other episodes but we can really dive deep into it um the idea of hiring somebody was just that was a real huge obstacle for me and it made it it held me up for a long time but um i eventually had to get over it but why don't why don't you talk about that for a second yeah, I mean, so I didn't have at, at first I didn't have fear around hiring people because I needed to hire someone. I mean, I just literally could not keep up with the calls that were coming in. Um, quick backstory, like I took over a company that was three technicians and, and now that was all pen and paper. There was no online. It was all word of mouth. Um so, you know, I completely transformed that when I took took it over, but I took over a company that was getting a call volume for three technicians. Well, let's call it two and a half towards the end, because one of them had started to phase out a little bit. Um, yeah. So I took over this company and I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying to do these remodel jobs. I'm trying to do these new construction jobs. I'm trying to get to the service jobs. Um, and like from the jump, I'm outnumbered by calls, you know? Uh, which is a great problem to have. I was very fortunate in that I, I wasn't starting a company from scratch where I'm scratching and clawing to get people to call me. 
Um, so I had a little bit of a leg up there. Uh, but like from day 10 of being in business, it's, oh man, we don't have enough time in the day to get there. There's, there's, uh, there's just too many calls coming in. Um, so I, I knew that I needed to hire someone the pretty quickly. Um, so like I, I just, I didn't know how to do it. So, you know, I posted an ad on Facebook, posted an ad on Craigslist, started, you know, doing half ass interviews with these people this was um, obviously before you had any kind of hiring platform before eddie yeah no this and is you before, were just there was no system for everything oh there's no system for anything um so you know i i hired i hired a guy i fought, the first guy i hired i had to fire him 23 hours after he started um that's a record I, uh, yeah well maybe good. maybe not i mean we're in we're in the blue collar trade, so there's a. It's probably not yeah, a record, but that's pretty. No, cool. it's probably it was a record for us. Um, and then you know the second guy I hired, he maybe last two weeks. Um, and then I quickly developed a fear of not hiring the guy, but of having to fire the guy, because those yeah. first two experiences were so short lived. Um, and I mean, it's like you hire someone whether they had a previous job, they didn't, whatever you, you kind of, you take on this burden of, you know, they're now my responsibility, right? Like yeah. I am their, their source of income for their lifestyle. And to hire a guy who quits his job, gives two weeks notice, comes to work for you. And then 23 <laughs> hours later, you got to be like, all right, hit the road, Jack. Yeah. Um, and now he's got no job. Um, so I kind of developed a fear in the, in the second half of the hiring and they kind of work hand in hand um, is that typically you're scared to hire. And then after you hire, you're scared to fire, but I was so desperate to hire that I skipped right over that one. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue to what we, to the way fear affected you as opposed to me. And I think we talked more about some of my fears in hiring in some of the other episodes, but Talk about what it was like to try to find somebody before you had a system in place and then after you had a system in place, whether that be Eddie or Applicant Pro, just a system in general. Yeah, I mean, before it was just like, hey, I was posting these blind ads to Instagram or Facebook or even Craigslist, and I don't recommend hiring people from Craigslist. <laughs> um especially yeah. in the year 2024 um <clears throat> you ain't you ain't gonna find much quality on there but yeah. um unless you need a you stalker know. or a well I don't know. <laughs> yeah um and then we even tried indeed for a little while we just threw a bunch of money away there um but uh yeah it was a lot of effort for very 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 few applications did you ever put um, flyers up in the supply house? Oh yeah, we got zero calls for them. And <clears throat> yeah, and a local too. pizza place and 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 um we had like a little brochures on why it's so great to come work for us. Uh but yeah. But nobody's you looking. Know, you know, you're no. you're broadcasting <laughs> a bunch of uh to to a bunch of eyes that aren't looking your way at the time. Yeah. Um so yeah, I mean, it, it was a disaster. It was, you know, we were just trying to, it's like being blindfolded and trying to throw darts and hit the hit the bullseye. Um, and then and even found... when you get somebody on your way, let me just tell say this, even when you yeah, get ahead. somebody to, to come your way and to talk to you, at least for us, it was like, yeah, man, all right, uh, why don't you, can you start today or, or uh, <laughs> you, you want to just show up tomorrow? We didn't have anything as far as well, a way to send guys information to fill out any kind of training or anything. Yeah, uh, there was no employee handbook. There was there was no benefits package. There was no nothing. Um, and that's why you struggle to find quality guys, right? Yeah. So, yeah, once we found Eddie, it kind of. It was great from the hiring piece. It's amazing from the onboarding section um, in that it kind of like 
walks you through like, hey, do you want to add this to your onboard? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, we need we need an employee handbook. They're telling us we need an employee. We better get an employee handbook. You know, right. oh, do you want to add your benefits package? Do you want to add your time off policy? Do you want to add your sick days policy? Um, so it, it can kind of baby you along if, you know, you're new to this, you know, running a business CEO thing where there are certain things you have to do, right, that you don't even know you have to do because it was never done for you because you always work for people that didn't have these things in place. Um, yeah. It makes it more of, automated. Yeah. Yeah. And systemized. Sure. We talk yep. a lot about systemization and just becoming systemized. And this is a this is a prime example if you look at it from the employee's standpoint, when they are babied through, just like you're talking, the the platform babies you through how to systemize hiring. When the employee comes along and, and they are told, this is the next step, this is the next step, this is the next step. Uh, there's a deadline for filling all this information out. Uh, here's what to expect on your first day. Here's what to wear. Here's what, who to report to. I remember showing up for jobs when I was 16, 17, and you had to go find, I mean, nobody was, it was just in, in disarray. Like the experience, I mean, like I remember one time showing up mm -hmm. for a, for a, uh, uh, at a, I worked at a bumper plant at one time and it was, oh man, that was what sent me to college because I, I said, I'm never doing this for, for my entire life. It was like, uh, I was right out of, right out of high school. But when, my first day, I was kind of walk, wandering around, and I couldn't find who I was supposed to talk to, and it, it, it took forever for me to for me to get you know anywhere. So I remember that, and I remember. Um, so you kind of think about things like that from the employee's perspective, but the platform will will tell you or will tell the employee this is who you need to report to. Uh, this is the number you call if you have any questions, all the way down to, and then you, and then they start, and you continue to train them. Um, before they get in a truck, we would just, before we would just throw somebody on a truck with somebody and then expect them to learn within a month. And then we'd throw them on their truck. And that, in hindsight, that was just, we were kind of throwing them to the wolves. Hmm. Yeah. It's real nice to have that, that onboarding section of Eddie, where it kind of just automates everything, has them set up their service type email, has them, uh, set up their Eddie login, has them set up their work email address, um, you know, tells them where to be, when to be there, who to meet with. Um, and our, I mean, our whole process between Eddie and, um, and Calendly for the interview process, it's, it's pretty streamlined and it's pretty, it's pretty automatic. We don't really have many where we're like, Oh, we got to tell this guy where he's got to be on his first day or where he's got to be for the interview. So. Yeah. Uh there's a little plug there for Eddie. Uh yeah. didn't plan on didn't plan on doing that, but yeah. Well, you talk about the <clears throat> the interview like when you come in to interview, like we've got it down. We've we've uh tweaked the process to a point where the first interview is really conducted by our our dispatcher. She calls and she just does a little personal uh, back and forth, nothing really about plumbing, but it's to weed out the, the guys that sound like they're creeps, you know, mm -hmm. we call it the creep factor in the, in, in the success Academy. And if, if the person passes that, then in the meantime, the background check and the driving record check is going through. Um, then, after all of that's passed, they can they can meet with our general manager in a face to face interview with, you know, it's about, you know, how skilled are you at plumbing and other things too, not not just plumbing, but you know, character questions and situational questions. And it's I just I just we've we when we put Eddie in place and, and created that system, it just I'm really proud of that system that we have in place, but that's the difference between that's the difference between not having a system in place when you when you talk about hiring and having a system in place, and that alleviates that angst or that anxiety. Like, what what are we going to do with them the first day, or what you know, all the anxieties that come along with it. There's bullet points along the way that you that you 
you can follow. And, you know, aside from hiring, you know, as we go down in other modules, some of the anxiety that comes along with creating raving fans, that was, that's one of the, that's one of the, the, the modules that we, we go through. And you just spoke on this not too long ago and, it's not easy that the things that are introduced are not easy because they, they cost a lot of money, right? <clears throat> yeah. Let's face it. Home service companies are a dime a dozen and Mrs. Jones has many to choose from. Now it may not be PC, but she does judge a book by its cover. That's why there's kick charge the industry's leading and most awarded branding and truck wrap design agency who has been instrumental in getting home service providers noticed for over 20 years. And right now kick charge is offering a $500 rebate to all coaches corner listeners. To get more information. Go to the million dollar plumber.com forward slash kick charge and start getting Getting noticed today. You got to think about, you know, who who is the best company that's ever created raving fans? It's Apple. Um, and Apple did this by making sure that the end user experience was as seamless as possible. Um, the way they created raving fans is, you know, uh, and we're not talking about back when the Macintosh computers were out. And you'd play on those in computer class. You played the Oregon Trail in second grade. Um, but we're talking about, you know, when the iPhone came out, right? Like 2006, 2007, they come out with this iPhone. And now you kind of have, you know, this little mini computer in your pocket. Um, and it made things super convenient for the end user. And they start to gain traction 2008, 2009. Um, and then they figure out a way to make your phone and your laptop sync with each other so that things are on both of them, right? They come out with the iCloud, <clears throat> um, you know, and then they just keep evolving on that where it's like now I could have on my iPhone, I could have the internet open, right? I could be on Safari and I could have a web page open. I'm like, oh, I want to look at that on my computer right on the bottom dock of my MacBook is a little safari icon with a phone next to it i click on that and it brings up the page that i'm looking at on my computer on my yeah. phone rather um yeah. and airdrop and all that so they made it oh they made it a way for the end user to as easily as possible access information um so when we try and apply that to a plumbing business it, it's really just how easy are we making it for people to book appointments with us? Yeah. How easy are we making it for the process of, you know, them having to wait for us then, right? Like we give them a four hour window and then, oh, when are they going to be here type of thing, right? Well, when when we dispatch to a job, they get a little tracking link and they could click on that and they could see where our truck's out and how long it's going to take to get to their house. Yeah, well, um, talking about that, what about when you initially, that comes from Service Titan, Mm -hmm. uh, when you were introduced to Service Titan and you realized how much it was going to cost, it was probably before you realized that it's that's only a percentage of your revenue. It's before that we may have been looking at the number like, oh man, this is going to cost. I think it was going to cost like, I think it was going to cost like $1,500 a month when I first signed up. That was like four years ago, Service Titan. And I was just scared to death. You know, hmm. but it yeah, introduced well, you, all that technology that you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about that in terms of it's going to cost me, right? Yeah. Not how much is that actually per billable hour that we're going to be billing? Because, you know, we talk about the customer pays for everything. And if we need this software to run our business, the customer needs to pay for us to have that software. So that's going to be incorporated into our hourly rate. Yeah. Um and if you broke that fifteen hundred dollars a month down, it's probably two or three bucks an hour. I mean, we're not right. talking about life changing money here. <clears throat> but you see the mindset. You see the mindset that you get stuck in. Like that was mm -hmm. the first thing I thought of. And oh yeah. I hear it from people all the time. Like, hey, I've got a goal. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this by the end of the year. Whether it's I'm gonna get a private coach by the end of the year. If you wait until you can afford it you'll never do it because yeah. you're thinking about 
thinking about it the wrong way. And that's what, yeah. that's one of the things private coaching can help you with. But that mindset right there, initially when I got service time, I was like, man, this is, this is just so expensive. And I was scared to death. But shortly after that, maybe once we got the on, on, onboarding done and we got all the kinks out. And I mean, like the users, all of our technicians had to, you know, had to be trained on how to use it. We had to get tablets and phones. And again, this, this, series is about fear <clears throat> that skyrockets that skyrockets your uh that skyrockets your uh phone bill and before you before you're able to understand still that it's just a percentage of your revenue it's scary and mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now i would say three months after we were onboarded i don't i don't know how we could do it without service titan we couldn't do it without or yeah. some platform like that. But the yeah, some... you were talking about the technology, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, you brought up a good point in that, you know, waiting till you can afford something usually doesn't yield results. Yeah. Um, you know, we kind of have to at points act as if act where we want to be, right? Um <clears throat> and you know, I kind of learned that early on in life. I was having a conversation with my mom and you know, we had our first kid young. We were 21 years old. Um <laughs> you know, he was two or three or four at the time. And, you know, she was like, you know, when are you guys gonna have another kid? When are you guys gonna have another kid? When are you gonna have another kid? I was like, mom, I can't afford the, the one kid I have. <laughs> you know, what do yeah. you need to have another one? Um, and she, I mean, she just said to me, she said, honey, look, if you wait until you can afford to have another kid, you'll never be able to afford to have another kid. Yeah, I but, couldn't agree but, more. But if you have another one, you'll figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. That's the and example that I would like to that that's the example that I thought of. Yeah. And it's kind of it's like that with business. It just yeah. is. Um you will as as an entrepreneur at heart, you will always find a way to make it work. Um and it might force you to do things that you're uncomfortable with that you don't want to do, whether it's letting go of that dead weight that's costing you an extra X amount of dollars a month. Um or selling that extra van that you've been holding onto in hopes that you're going to add another tech or hiring a private coach uh, to really get you to that next level or getting that well, office space. Well, just like you said, man, I didn't have time to be scared of firing somebody. I had to hire somebody. Remember when mm -hmm. you took the business over? That's yeah. the same thing. It's the same logic when you, because you were, you came into a situation where you were forced to make a decision and that's really where all the growth is, is when you are forced to make a decision. So whether it's hiring a private coach or going out and buying a van before you're actually ready, hiring a person before you actually really are busy enough, mm -hmm. those are counterintuitive things and they don't feel like emotionally the right thing to do. But when you hire somebody and you got one guy sitting at the shop, you start making moves because you have to yep. a lot like you you had to hire people because the phone was ringing off the hook yeah yeah what about sure. the cost of all the things you have to do to create a white glove experience from from you know shoe covers floor protection uh the software service titan or field pulse or w w there are a few of them out there uh, yeah all of that added together, that's a, uh, and that's before you get to the customer's house to make yeah. the money. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, I just had an interesting conversation with one of my one-on-one -on -one clients um, and, you know, we were kind of just, you know, he's getting ready to hire um, another guy and we were kind of just walking through his HHR. Um, you know, what do you have for paying the guys? What do you have for paying you? What do you have for paying your wife who's running the office? <clears throat> And so many people go through that HHR calculator with a scarcity mindset the first time they go through it. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't, they don't go through it for where they want to be four to six months from now. And that's the biggest mistake I see people make when they are coming up with how much do I need to charge an hour? It's based on where am I at right now? Mm -hmm. um, and in going through that, you know, it's okay. What are you paying yourself? What are you paying the guys? What are you paying your wife who's running the office? Oh, well, I'm not paying my wife who's running the office. Well, she needs to be paid. 
She's doing a job. What would you have to pay somebody else that was doing her job? Um, and then, you know, we get down the list a little bit. And like you said, we get down to supplies expense. And I'm like, what do you got in supplies expense? He's like, uh, I don't know, it was something ridiculous, like 500 bucks for the year. Um, and I'm, I said to him, like, what about rags? What about booties? What about, you know, mats, to tool mats to put down so you're not scratching surfaces? What about red carpets? What about, what about? Uh, bottled you know, water for the guys. Yeah, bottled water, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, drop cloths, like all these things that we, we don't take into account. And he had $500 for the year. Um, yeah. So it's an important lesson. And, you know, that, like we said two seconds ago, the customer pays for everything. And if we need those things to provide the service that we need to provide, the customer has to pay for that. Yeah. And when we look at things as a percentage of our revenue, it's way easier to digest and, and easier to keep up with. Because if that number starts going up, you know that you need to fix a problem. You know, and it's usually a pricing problem. <clears throat> yeah. But, um, before, okay, so so moving on to to module nine, that's the winning team module, and it, and and we talk about it after you hire somebody. Um, realizing just what they are, and friendly, not friends, comes into my mind. And it's really hard when you're when you're first starting out because you're so close to the guys. You're working with them hand in hand. You don't have a general manager that is the liaison between the owner and the um, the, the the technicians. And and we're not talking about from a friend standpoint. That's what's so hard to to differentiate from. You're not separating yourself because you're better or in any way. But you you can't you can't have a a friendly relation, like a friendship and a business relationship. Like I wouldn't, I, I would never hire another one of my friends. I would never hire another one of my friends. Um, it just muddies the water too much. I did that one and, time and it was yeah. the worst firing I've ever had. Yeah. And to that point, you shouldn't be hiring any of your guys, friends. You shouldn't be right. hiring any of your guys, girlfriends or spouses. Like there needs it to makes be, it you know, difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's an HR nightmare. And, and, you know, when you come into this thing, you're not thinking of it through that lens, through, well, what if this person quits? Or what if, what, or what if you know, I hire this guy's wife to work in the office and then they get in a fight and they get divorced. And it's like, there's just so much that goes on that it's just, we need to, we need to stay away from those things yeah. as much as possible. Right. Well, an employee is 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 your greatest asset and and they sh they should view themselves as that you know in, in terms of their performance am i an asset to the company not mm -hmm. am i a nice guy not am i friends with the owner not am i um cool to hang out with on the weekend so i can get preferential treatment at work whatever it is an asset for the company is do i treat the customers fairly and politely and respectfully do they like me? Do I make money for the company? And do I follow the procedures and policies that I'm asked to follow? Um, and that's what makes a good asset as an employee. And, you know, having having an alpha on your crew is great. That can do all that. Having a bunch of alphas, what do you think about that? Like, that's a conversation we could have. It, at first glance, you would think, man, I need all all stars. That's what I want is all all stars. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to talk about the problem that comes along with having a bunch of all stars? Um, well, yeah, there's a couple things. The, so <laughs> all stars, let's put it this way. Um, imagine having Derek Jeter and having a Rob. Which one on your team is going to require more extracurricular attention, right? To keep them on task, to keep them on focus, um, to keep them from staying all night out all night with the superstars. Um, and who's going to show up every day and be ready to work and ready to do it for the team? Not for A-Rod, but to do it for the team. So is it great to have an A-Rod? Yeah. 
it, it's great. It's great to have someone that's going to hit 50 homers. Um, it's great to have someone that's going to have, you know, 125 RBIs. Um, they're going to hit, you know, 260 to 275 average. But you also need those guys that are going to hit 300 consistently. They're going to have 12 to 15 homers in clutch situations that are going to have a gold glove. Um, I don't know why I immediately thought of baseball, but it's, you know, it's a very easy analogy to the dichotomy of, hey, they are equally as important to the team, right? Like, yeah, you can win a World Series having both of these guys on your team. You take one out, you might not win a World Series, but it's very important that both of them are there. Yeah. And just to kind of speak on how hard it is to be a manager of a bunch of super alphas, you know, I think of Phil Jackson when he had the Chicago Bulls, when he had Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, um, Dennis Rodman, Horace Grant, and the list goes on and on. Um, those are all players that that are used to being, you know, treated a certain way. They're used to being catered to. And when you get them all in the same place, I mean, it really doesn't take but one to be like, you know what, I'm going to do, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm, I'm, I'm successful. I'm going to just do my own thing. And if they don't like it, they're not going to fire me because I make this much money for them. I do this. And and that is a terrible situation to be in. And you have to be ready to, to turn that around or cut it off because yeah. Um, it's just a tough situation and you can be an A player and, and also respect the company that you work for and want to do good for the company and not just yourself. I mean, I've had to get, I've had to, to, to part ways with, with people that just at all costs, they were like, you know, I'm the one that's bringing in the money. Um, so I'm just going to do what I want, whether it be, you know, not following company procedures, you know, kind of spreading a bad attitude to the, to the other team players. And um, it's just, it's just something that you really can't let go on. Cause once you let it go on, it just gets out of hand, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I mean, a perfect, a perfect example is what's going on. I mean, I'm not a huge basketball fan, but what, what's going on in the NBA the last, you know, 10 years, right. What's going on is that they try to form these super teams where they bring all these guys that score 40 or 50 points a night and mm -hmm. hey, wouldn't it be great if we got them on the same team? But it's a perfect you know, example. They might they might get a championship or two championships out of it, right? But inevitably it becomes, well, he's not passing to me. He's taking too many shots. Um, he's getting all the good jobs, he's getting all the water heaters, he's getting all the boiler replacements, he's getting all the grinder pumps. Um, and it starts the finger pointing because now instead of them all scoring 40 or 50 a night when they're on the team with a bunch of B players and they're the all-star. Now they're all scoring 20 to 30 a night and their stats are suffering. Um, yeah. And, and you'll have that, you know, when, when it comes to business, it's going to be, there's going to be people that you could just send them to whatever job you can, you just send them there and they're going to do their best because they believe in the company and they believe in your vision and they believe in the culture. Um, but there's going to be guys that they, they want all the water eater calls. Yeah. They want all the main lines. And give me a guy with good character and a good attitude and a good team player over over a prima donna any day, and mm -hmm. I'll show you a good company that's consistent and it doesn't drive the general manager nuts, you know. Yeah. Um, another another huge stressor in this module, and we'll kind of round it out on this one is um payday, like how you pay people, and with us paying performance pay piece rate. That was a um, a huge stressor for me. It was the one thing where I was like, I'm going to do everything in the Success Academy but this. I um, <laughs> It was scared me to death. I was used to paying guys hour hourly, and I said there's, there's no other way. Um, I didn't know anything about commission really. But I had I have guys that have come over from bigger companies that were, were on commission, and they said, I just, man, you know, we could we could make good money but we never see our families and I'm just tired of being a tool in the, in the toolbox that's just gets run ragged. 
you know, because it doesn't, yeah. you don't know when that job's coming in, but if you want to make money, you got to go do it, even if it's at, you know, whatever time. Yeah, it's actually interesting. I was talking to one of my private clients too, and he was on piece rate at a different company that he worked for mm -hmm. um, before he started his business and before he came to MDP. Um, and they were on a single tier piece rate system with no base pay. Really? No guarantee? No guarantee. So it was, <clears throat> hey, literally, I'm going to sit at the shop until five or six o'clock hoping that something comes in because it's Wednesday or Thursday and I have three sold hours this week, right? Um, yeah. Oh, man, that is that Talk is about brutal. a stressor. I mean, I think that's even worse than hourly. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. No guarantee at all. That's a no. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, so, it makes it easier on the business owner, but I don't know how you could keep somebody like that. Yeah. Oof, I couldn't imagine. Uh, but, you know, getting the initial shock of, okay, uh, these guys could potentially make upwards of three grand a week. How am I going to be able to afford that? And what does it look like? And how does the math work? And I just didn't, I didn't want to tax my brain to figure it out. Um, but I heard Laura say in one of the um, potty talks, she said, you know, just just do like a mock payday and show the guys this is what you would have made on pay. I mean, on piece rate, this is what you make hourly. Look at the difference. And um, really quickly, they learned that they that was a better way. The performance pay is a better pay every time. Um you know, and if it yeah, gets me and, slow, you, me and you both did the same thing where we did like a month's notice and we showed them both of those so that they could keep track of it and they could see how this is a benefit to them. Yeah. You might lose a guy or two. You might not. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I actually uh one guy was particularly against it. Um mm -hmm. and we went we wound up we wound up losing him, but that was just because he had just got his license. He wanted to go out on his own, open his own business. Um, which is great. I love to see my employees thriving. I, I love to see them spread their wings and really try and go after things in life, right? On a personal mm -hmm. side. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were happy to see that. Um, we, we miss him, obviously, but, um, you know, he was particularly against it. Um, and it was a weird timing where like, like a week before we made this announcement, he was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he came to me maybe a month or a month and a half later. And he was like, Hey, it has nothing to do with, with the change. Like I was actually kind of getting excited about it. Cause I got to see the numbers and I was like really excited to see how I was going to stack up against everybody else and all that. Um, but it speaks a lot to the culture of your business. Um, if you can make a change like that, um, and you don't lose anyone. Um, and then not only do you not lose anyone, but you know, when this guy told me that he was getting ready to go out on his own, I mean, he was, he was, he was upset. He was borderline, you know, tearing up because he loved working for us so much. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you telling me about that and that was, it was hard for you. It was hard for you. It was hard for the people that got to know him and mm -hmm. he's a great guy. And that was really respectful, uh, of you to 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 treat him that way but listen we're going to continue this conversation because peace rate is a huge stressor for a lot of people uh, it's common to kind of hit that roadblock but yeah. you're gonna have to wait till next week to hear the rest we're going to tell you what our experiences have been with performance rate so we got to get out of here all right see you later tony all right. All right. Well, that does it for this episode of the Coach's Corner. Make sure to like and subscribe below and make sure you join us on our next episode to continue to learn how to stop thinking like a tradesman and start thinking like a CEO. Thanks for stopping by.